I'm going to try to answer two questions for you today. What is mathematics and what do mathematicians do? If we ask someone on the street, what does a mathematician do? What sort of answers might we get? Some might say they do calculus or algebra. Some might mention some big problems like the Riemann hypothesis or Fermat's last theorem. Some might say mathematicians just add numbers all day. If I'd been asked, I would have said something like, they sit down at their desks with pen and paper and work on some interesting problem or new idea. Which is a fine enough answer if you don't want to learn how they do it yourself. It's a bit like a programmer saying, I just sit at my laptop and type. The problem, in my view, is that it's actually pretty hard to explain what a mathematician does because I don't think people know what mathematics is. You may think that mathematics is this abstract logic game for the nerdiest of nerds, but actually it's a way to take our ideas from reality, pare them down to their barest bones, and run experiments on them, at least in my view. And with this definition, mathematicians are the people who run this process on mathematical ideas. Lots and lots of mathematical ideas stretching back thousands of years. Now, I don't pretend that these are the definitive answers to these questions. Instead, I want to present what I think could be an interesting way to approach mathematics as a whole, especially if you, the viewer, are interested in trying this mathematics thing and are just poking around at the edges right now. So, pretend you're a mathematician. Someone who's enthusiastic enough about mathematics that they start playing around with it. How do you even start playing around with mathematics, though? Well, there's a lot of ways, but I think one simple way is to ask a question about math and try to answer it. But how do you even find a question to ask? And how do you try to answer that question once you have it? In this video, I'm going to try to cover what I think are three simple steps to doing some mathematics. One, pick a question to ask. Two, run some experiments to try to answer your question and see what you find. And three, check your work and tell others your results. This is also known as peer review. This may not seem like a mathematical approach at this level, but I hope things will become clearer as we go along. For now, the stage is set. Let us begin. Part one. How do you get a question? So what I'm going to do is, instead of trying to ask you to ask a question, which would be rather difficult considering this is a published video, I'm going to pose a question to you. Let's start with something very familiar to us, our Earth. Our Earth is a sphere, or close enough to it for our purposes. But if you take a sphere, draw on the lines of latitude and longitude like we have on Earth, what can we say about this object? Well, let's try drawing a triangle. We can draw a triangle with one of the sides on the equator, one at zero degrees through Greenwich in the UK, and the third side going through 90 degrees east, through Western China and Bangladesh. Now you have a triangle but it has three right angles. There's one right angle at the North Pole between zero degrees and 90 degrees, and there's two at the equator, between the equator and the lines of longitude. This is a 270 degree triangle. How can this be? Didn't we learn in school that triangles always have 180 degrees, no more and no less? Why are spheres different? Are there any other differences? Can we learn more? The point I want to emphasize here is that mathematicians don't ask arbitrary questions. We're not just playing random games. We take ideas from reality, from our previous knowledge, and from recent discoveries and research, and we ask questions about what we know and what we think we know. These questions could be things like, do we have a solid understanding of a mathematical technique or proof? Can we ask questions that develop these techniques further? Can we use these techniques, our old ones and our new ones, to solve some problems, some questions that we've had 
for some time, maybe. Can we even answer the questions that we have? And especially with this question, what happens when you try to draw a triangle on a sphere? Does something break? The motivation for this question came from our real life, our lines of latitude and longitude, our GPS coordinates, and our planet. It didn't come from some thought experiment where, what happens if we make a triangle that has three right angles? Now, a lot of our mathematics is thought experiments, but my point here is that we draw an incredible amount of inspiration just from our everyday life. We took ideas from our real life, the Earth and its lines of latitude and longitude, and turned them into a question in mathematics, a question about spheres and triangles. What we observe in real life and in older math observes what we try to turn into new math. And that math can run away from that starting point, in especially from real life. But almost always, if you look back far enough, there is some starting point that we built all of this new mathematics from. And once we have that starting point, we're off and running. Part two, how do you run an experiment? Now that we have our spherical geometry, our weird triangles on spheres, the ones with three right angles, or at least ones with more than two right angles, more than 180 degrees, what do we do with this knowledge now? Well, as I said at the beginning of this video, the way you do mathematics at this point is once you have a question, you start running experiments on your question and see if those help get you towards an answer. In this case, we have spherical geometry, but we also have our regular flat geometry from school. One simple experiment we could do is compare the new spherical geometry with the old flat geometry. But another question pops up. What exactly was the old geometry from school? Well, one way to describe that old geometry is as the geometry of flat pieces of paper. Usually we call this Euclidean geometry, named after the ancient Greek mathematician Euclid. He's considered one of the greatest geometers, largely because he was one of the oldest, earliest ones, and also because of his most famous book, The Elements, which essentially is him writing down as much geometry as he could and turning it into a treatise on how do we prove all of these cool things from simple ideas at the bottom. At the beginning of The Elements, he starts with some definitions. What's a point? What's a straight line? What's a triangle? What's a circle? And then he defines some common notions. Things like, if you have two line segments that start and end at the same points, they're the same line segment. A equals A. Simple stuff like that. Euclid also starts with some postulates what we would call axioms today. Axioms are unchallenged assumptions that we use as starting points and then build arguments and turn those arguments into things like theorems. For the rest of this video, when I'm referring to postulates, I'm specifically referring to Euclid and his postulates in the elements. And when I say axioms, I mean general unchallenged assumptions in mathematics. So, Let's take a look at Euclid's postulates, because this is actually going to be pretty important for our experiment. The first postulate is this. A unique straight line can be drawn between any two points. The second postulate is that any straight line segment can be extended indefinitely. The third postulate is a circle of any radius and center can be drawn on the plane. The fourth postulate is that all right angles are equal to each other. Fair enough. And the fifth postulate is, given a line and a point not on that line, there is a unique line through that point that does not intersect with the other line. Heavy asterisks all around, I'm skipping a lot of nuance and discussion. Now, a quick note about that fifth postulate. Yes, it is wordier than the others, that's going to be a point for later. and. What it's actually saying is that in our flat Euclidean geometry, there are parallel lines, 
but there is one unique parallel line through any point you care to name. Single unique parallel line. That's important for later. Going back to our spherical geometry, well, the fourth postulate is fine. Right angles are still right angles, at least as far as we can tell. But the first and second postulates, they're a little shaky. There's a lot of shortest lines between the North and South Pole. None of them unique. And in, there's an infinite number of them. And we call them the lines of longitude. For the second postulate, yeah, you can keep extending a line on a sphere, but it wraps around on itself eventually. So is that really infinite? It's kind of shaky. The third and fifth postulates, though, they're kind of completely broken. You can't draw a circle of any radius on the sphere because there's a maximum size to the sphere. And the fifth postulate is in shambles. You can start out with two lines that seem parallel, but as you extend them, they eventually intersect each other. Think of the lines of longitude again. They intersect at the poles, even though they start out parallel at the equator, or at least they start out looking parallel at the equator. We've already seen that triangles get beefy on our sphere. They have more than 180 degrees. But we also lose several nice things from Euclidean geometry. I'm just going to run through them real quickly. If we try to draw similar triangles, triangles that have the same angles and different side lengths, turns out we can't. The only way to get a triangle with the same angles on our sphere is to draw a triangle with the same side lengths, exactly the same side lengths. This also means that the Pythagorean theorem no longer works. There is a lot more that can be said here. For example, we could get our third postulate back by using a curved infinite plane instead of a sphere. This is called elliptic geometry and it will come back later. But I think we can already see that our experiment with spheres and triangles has brought up some really surprising results already. To wrap this section up, when we examine a new interesting idea, it helps to compare it with old ideas, not just to find the differences, but the similarities as well. In our example, we could still draw straight lines and points and triangles, but the way those things worked and the way they interacted with each other changed on the new setting. As I've said, there's a lot more we could learn from spherical geometry, but we already have some interesting and surprising experimental results here. With these results in hand, we can move forward to the most important and scariest part of the whole process. Checking our work and then showing it to others. In short, peer review. Part three, how does our work hold up to peer review? Well, one way we could figure out if our results are convincing to other people is to simply say, our results make sense, we don't need to convince you, hooray. But if you actually want to work towards being convincing, you need to put in a little more legwork. Of course, what's going to be convincing depends on your audience. If you're just teaching a fifth grade math class about 180 degree triangles, they're not going to need that much convincing. But they may not understand what you're saying without more help. On the other hand, your peers in the math department will probably need a lot more convincing. So much so that they need heavy attention to detail and logic, what we call rigor. Now, the process of how to rigorously prove a theorem could be the subject of an entire video series. So instead, I'll focus on two really broad categories of, now I'm going to show my community this cool thing I made. Number one, critique. Checking if your mathematics is built on relatively solid logic. And number two, continuation. Adding to the idea with further investigations and experiments, bringing the idea into new contexts, comparing the new idea with old ideas, or directly combining the idea with other ideas. There's a lot of ways you could categorize peer review. This is just a simple one for the purposes of this video and I think it'll be fine for now. Since I'm not gonna be looking in depth into the incredibly important section of mathematics that is making your arguments rigorous, let's instead take a step back. In our real life history, we know that non-Euclidean geometry has been 
a thing that we've been studying for hundreds of years. So why don't we look at the historical process of peer review for our non-Euclidean geometry? Part 1. The Critique To begin with, most people didn't focus on spherical geometry for its own sake. What these mathematicians, including Alhazen of the Islamic world and Zakari of Italy, what they're trying to do instead of focusing on spherical geometry was more about investigating Euclidean geometry. They were looking at that complex fifth postulate again, and they were trying to prove maybe that it's not its own axiom, but it was a theorem that could be proved from other axioms. So they were using spherical geometry as a test case for if we break the fifth postulate here, where there are no parallel lines at all, can we prove that the great geometry of Euclid is the most correct of them all? In short, they went in with a bias. To be fair to them, though, spherical geometry just kind of breaks too many of Euclid's postulates. Like I mentioned in the last section, our third and fifth postulates are broken outright, and our first and second are on shaky ground. To finally convince the mathematics community that you could have valid non-Euclidean geometry, we needed not just spherical geometry, but other kinds of geometry on firmer ground. This process took several hundred years of back and forth, and I cannot cover it all here. But I want to highlight one of the steps toward a fully convincing argument. Eugenio Beltrami's proof that hyperbolic geometry is just as consistent as Euclidean geometry is, and vice versa. What is hyperbolic geometry, though? Well, to oversimplify a lot, instead of your beefy triangles from spherical and elliptic geometry, hyperbolic geometry has triangles with less than 180 degrees. Skinny triangles. It also has infinite parallel lines instead of zero or just one. Another weird quirk of hyperbolic geometry is that if you look at the infinite hyperbolic plane, it's weird in that you cannot actually fully visualize it in three dimensions. You have to be in four dimensions to do that. There's tricks you can do to sort of squash it down to the three dimensions or two dimensions, as you can see on the slide here. But it's weird that you have a good example of elliptic and spherical geometry with a sphere, but not really with hyperbolic geometry. Anyway, the fact that Beltrami could prove that hyperbolic geometry and its axioms were at least as consistent as Euclidean geometry. If something was wrong with hyperbolic geometry and eventually the other non-Euclidean geometries, then there was something equally as wrong with Euclidean geometry. There was no supremacy of Euclid. And one of the things that implied was that people had assumed before that our universe was just Euclidean, but with non-Euclidean geometries in the race now, whether or not the universe is Euclidean or not has to be proved through observation and experiment by astronomers and cosmologists, not by mathematics alone, as people had assumed for hundreds of years before, which was ludicrous to them. The other part of peer review is continuation. There's a lot of great things that came out of non-Euclidean geometry in the years that followed it and a lot of work it inspired. But I'll focus on one application here, general relativity. One of the main players in the formulation of non-Euclidean geometry was Bernhard Riemann, of Riemann hypothesis fame. He first formulated elliptic geometry, but he also described the more general Riemannian geometry. The thing about elliptic geometry and spherical geometry is that you have positive curvature, so beefy triangles. With Euclidean geometry, you have zero curvature, exactly 180 degrees. And with hyperbolic geometry, you had less than 180 degrees, skinny triangles. With Riemannian geometry, instead of consistent curvature, like the examples I just mentioned, you have all sorts of weird general curvature which is great when you have general curve geometry, like in Einstein's theory of general relativity. Riemannian geometry allows us to calculate things like how black holes warp space-time and light around them. Without it, frankly, a lot of that math would be impossible. 
To wrap up, I should reiterate that this process of critique and continuation carried on for several decades after Beltrami, Riemann, and the many others I didn't cover here. There was a lot of hand-wringing and philosophy and upheaval in the math community. I'll cover some of that in the next section of the video. But in short, peer review is incredibly important, even though it can take decades. We need it both for the testing of ideas, but also just because sharing those ideas can sometimes stimulate new ones. The first people to publish work on hyperbolic geometry were Lobachevsky and Bolyai. And Riemann didn't start his work on non-Euclidean geometry until after they published. If they hadn't, Riemann may never have worked on these ideas at all, and we'd be out of theory of relativity. And sometimes, Peer review helps convince ourselves that we're correct in the first place. After all, Alhazen and Sakari didn't think their results about non-Euclidean geometry were special at all. And yet, look at where their mathematics ended up, admittedly after many, many years of further work and critique and continuation. And consider where he might go next. Part 4. Mathematical Thinking and the Scientific Method Now that we have this process, forming a question, experimenting, and reviewing. Did anyone else notice that this seems to look like kind of a scientific method for mathematics here? It's an interesting thought, but there's a few big holes in this idea. Most important of these holes, and what I'm going to be focusing on in this section is this. If we're running scientific experiments in mathematics, what are these things that we're experimenting on? There are a lot of possible answers to this question. And a lot of them date back to that big philosophical mix-up I alluded to earlier. The one that happened after we got non-Euclidean geometry and everybody's minds were blown. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each individual philosophy. Frankly, there's a lot of ground that I could cover. And a lot of ground that I don't have time to cover. So I'm just going to skip over that entire minefield of philosophy and just go with the answer that I like, which is, to put it reductively, mathematics is a social construct. Now, I don't mean social construct in the pejorative sense. What I mean is that mathematics works best when we consider it as something that we have done together, a human activity like art and the economy and politics and science. What mathematics is, is these ideas that we share and teach each other and build together. We base them on our experiences of physical reality. One plus one equals two, two plus two equals four, based on counting and then building up from there. And we also base mathematics on what's most convenient for our minds to work with and share. We pick and choose the mathematics and sometimes the mathematical notation that we like working with. There's a side tangent here about Newton's notation versus Leibniz's notation, but that's a topic for a different video. Now, I don't think this is the objective truth of mathematics. I just think that it's a pretty useful framework for a number of reasons. One of which is that I think it's a good framework for teaching our students why mathematics is important. I'm sure many of the teachers who watch this have heard the question, but when am I going to use this in my real life? Why is this important? Who cares? I don't know if this argument works necessarily for specific things like the quadratic formula and the Pythagorean theorem. Maybe it does. But my argument is we've been working with mathematics. We've been doing mathematics together about as long as we've been doing art and science and in some ways money. We found 20,000 year old bones with prime numbers carved into them, or at least tally marks with prime numbers, two tally marks, three tally marks, five tally marks, that sort of thing. At 20,000 years old, that's almost as old as our oldest art. Cave paintings we found that go back 40,000 to 35,000 years ago. Last go the most famous cave art, arguably, is 17,000 years old, younger than this evidence of mathematics. So I say mathematics, art, and science are all societally constructed. Humans have been building ideas and techniques and styles of mathematics, art, and science for millennia, and they've been doing it by competing and collaborating and sharing these ideas throughout our culture. We collaborate 
to teach each other mathematics and then we try to extend the mathematics we have to new and greater heights. We share ideas about what a triangle is, but we also share ideas about what a square number is and what a sphere is and what a straight line is and what the number two is. We share ideas about how they work and how they interact with each other. These ideas get updated and added to and discarded all the time. The number two was just the second number until we invented zero and then the negative numbers and then all the fractions in between and all the real numbers in between and then the complex numbers. And now the number two is one in a humongous, an uncountable infinity of numbers. If we've been making math as early as 20,000 years ago, maybe we should sit up and pay attention. Mathematics shares a lot in common with art. We share it with each other, and old mathematics doesn't really get old in the same way that old science does, for example. Old science is stale almost as soon as it's published in some fields. Old mathematics techniques, on the other hand, they get used and revamped all the time, like old art techniques of painting and sculpture, for example. Mathematics also has a lot in common with science. We investigate problems, create new ideas and definitions to solve those problems, experiment with those ideas, compare and combine them with old ideas, and subject it all to rigorous testing and peer review. Each time we find something that doesn't work or is inconvenient to use, we try other ideas. I also think that science has a lot more in common with how we did, say, ancient mathematics with carving numbers into bones than it does with pure logic or universal truth out there in the universe. I think we were experimenting. I think that experimenting is still mainly how mathematicians do their mathematics today. And if mathematics, art, and science are all so interesting that we've been doing each of them for this long, maybe mathematics is worth a second look. You may not like it anyway. I like comic books and hard rock and YouTube video essays, but I'm not a big fan of, say, romance or horror or EDM. But maybe you'll like some of it. There's a lot of mathematics out there, after all. It's a very wide field about a very wide world.